Hi everyone, we're very excited to welcome you to the inaugural Three Minute Thesis Competition at UT Southwestern. This competition was organized by the Graduate Student Organization and SPEAK. We also had the enthusiastic support of Dr. Natalie Lundstein and Dr. Lisa Dennison. And myself, Akansha Shah, Lexus Touch, and Priyanka Batia were the organizers. So we hope you enjoy it, and I'm going to turn it into the MCs. Hi, my name is Lexis Taji, and I'm one of the MCs today, going to be going over the introductions for the presenters. This has almost been two years in the making. We started kind of going over deliberating three-minute thesis back in January 2020, and now it's finally here in August 2021. And so we just want to thank the school, all the PIs for all their enthusiasm and support, and those who have volunteered their time as judges in order to get everything going for today. Uh, we had a larger pool of participants that went through preliminary judging, and then we have our eight finalists that we have here today. And so we just wanted to thank the 15 preliminary judges that we had here, all of our preliminary judges. And now I'm going to turn this over to Priyanka to thank all of our current judges that we have. So we'd like to thank the five judges that are here with us today in person. Um, we've got Dr. Mike Henney, uh, Dr. Vincent Tagliabracci, Dr. Michael Buschak, Dr. Lisa Gardner, and Dr. Joyce Reppa. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for your support for our participants. Um, and thank you to everyone who's here over Zoom. This is a really big deal for our participants and for UT Southwestern. And so thank you for supporting them. Um, for those of you who are new to this, the three minute thesis competition began at the University of Queensland in 2008. It's gained traction across Australia and New Zealand and has since grown to multinational events. It's now being held in over 85 countries at over 600 universities. This year, UT Southwestern joins that list with the first of what we hope to be a yearly event for our graduate students to compete in. The goal of the three minute thesis is to challenge the students to consolidate their ideas and research so they can be presented concisely to a non-specialist audience. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Alexis to start us off and introduce our first speaker. Let's kick off today's talk with Whitney Stewart from Dr. Danielle Robinson's lab in the CMB program. Whitney is an MD-PhD candidate currently doing research in the ophthalmology department on dry eye disease. We asked the participants to give us a one-liner for their introduction and Whitney told us that she is actively involved in the community service and health advocacy. Her talk is entitled, Envisioning a New Role for IGFB P3 Restoration of Ocular Surface Health. Today I'm going to tell you about a disease that affects 16 million Americans and in severe cases can cause disability and blindness. Dry eye disease is a chronic and painful disorder that negatively affects quality of life and has no effective treatment or cure. The outermost layer of the eye, the corneal epithelium, is essential to resisting stress from the outside environment with the protection of the overlying tear film. However, this system is not foolproof and when the health of the tear film is impeded, dry eye disease can strike. Those of us studying dry eye disease are looking at two main facets. The first one is to determine the mechanism by which the health of the tear film is impeded. And the second is to develop therapeutic treatments to allow us to be able to prevent the damage that we see occurring on the ocular surface into our patients. In dry eye disease, the tear film becomes more concentrated. And this phenomenon is called hyperosmolarity. And what we've seen is that as osmolarity increases, our corneal epithelial cells have negative impacts to their mitochondrial health. In my previous work, I've looked at insulin-like growth factor binding protein three, or BP3, and found that it is metabolically protective to corneal epithelial cells under stress. Interestingly, when our cells are exposed to increasing levels of hyperosmolar stress. We find that as osmolarity increases, BP3 decreases. Even more interestingly is that in an animal model of dry eye disease, we find that as length of time with the disease increases, BP3 once again decreases in their corneal epithelium. Therefore, if BP3 is affecting mitochondrial metabolism and mitochondrial health in these corneal epithelial cells. 
with supplementing it back to cells under acute hyperosmolar stress allow those cells to rescue their mitochondria and maintain their cell viability for longer? The answer to this question we now believe is yes. Not only does BP3 allow the cells to maintain near normal levels of mitochondrial metabolism when they're under hyperosmolar stress, but it's also affecting the mitochondrial quality control mechanisms and allowing for increased fusion to create these robust, elongated mitochondria that are better able to withstand this stress. Now, my work is specifically trying to determine what the mechanism behind BP3's role is and how we can best exploit that for therapeutic techniques to help these patients. Because by understanding BP3's role, we will not only better understand dry eye disease, but one day be able to help those 16 million Americans suffering from this disease. Thank you. All right, thank you, Whitney. Um, next, we have Martina Cosnovega. She is from Dr. Michael Rosen's lab in the Department of Biophysics, and Martina is in the Biological Chemistry program. Before starting her PhD, Martina was a pharmacist in Poland. She's a big enthusiast of science communication and outreach, and in her free time, she likes to cook, write a science blog, swim, and watch good movies. Her talk is entitled, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, The Story of Evil Phase Separation in Cancer. Cancer is one of the main causes of death worldwide. In fact, it's so common that by the end of my three-minute talk, five more Americans will have been diagnosed with cancer. In my PhD in the Rosen lab, I study a very scary type of cancer called nut carcinoma. It's particularly aggressive because patients on average survive less than one year from the time of diagnosis. Like in all other types of cancer, also in nut carcinoma, there is a Dr. Jekyll molecule who is normally a good guy, but at some point undergoes a transformation and becomes cancer-triggering Mr. Hyde. While nut carcinoma is still very poorly understood, we know that the Dr. Jekyll here is a protein called nut, shown in my slide as this orange-red bar. This protein is normally found only in male testes, but in nut carcinoma it gets fused with another protein called BRD4, shown in my slide as this blue bar, and in this way, Dr. Jekyll becomes Mr. Hyde. Now the fusion protein is not specifically localized to testes anymore, and it can show up in any part of male or female body. And the two components of this fusion work together to cause cancer cell transformation. It has been previously shown that our evil Mr. Hyde or brd 4 nut fusion protein can form droplet-like structures inside cells, like the ones I'm showing here in the center of my slide. Now, if you remember from school that liquid is one of the phases of matter, you might also remember that sometimes if we try to mix two liquid phases together, like for example, oil and water, they won't mix very well, but rather phase separate and form droplets. Well, it turns out that our BRD4 nut droplets are actually behaving very similarly to these oil and water droplets, therefore we also call this phenomenon phase separation. My hypothesis is that phase separation of BRD4 nut is important for the development and progression of nut carcinoma. And in my project I aim to understand how does the change of Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde lead to the formation of these phase separated droplets, and in turn, how does the occurrence of the carcinoma depend on it. So far, I found that only a very small fragment of nut is really necessary in fusion with BRD4 for the formation of these liquid droplets in cells. I also recently learned that this minimal BRD4 nut can actually cause some, uh, some cancer-related changes in cells very similarly to the full-length BRD4 nut protein. This discovery holds a great promise for targeting medicines against this minimal part of nut to control its phase separation. I hope this, but, that by undertaking this unique approach of studying the physical mechanisms of how these proteins phase separate, I can inspire new nut carcinoma therapies in the future. Thank you for your attention. Next is Akanksha Shah from the lab of Dr. Eric Olson in the GD&D program. Having lived in many countries, Akanksha can now change her English accent to match that of who she's talking to. The title of her talk is Twist in RMS, the Roadblock to Muscle Formation. 
Every two minutes, a parent is told, your child has cancer. These four words are the beginning of their child's journey through years of debil debilitating radiation and chemotherapy. Even after treatment, their cancer can resurface, and when it does, the possibility of cure remains very low. Passionate to improve therapeutic options for pediatric cancers, I began to study the most common soft tissue cancer in children, rhabdomyosarcoma, or RMS for short. Now, RMS tumors develop from cells that normally give rise to our skeletal muscles. However, we do not yet know what dictates this choice between these two very different outcomes, normal muscle development seen on the left versus RMS formation seen on the right. Now, you can imagine these crucial decisions like a car approaching an intersection. The cell here is representative of a car and the signs and signals at the intersection tell the cell which road to take. To take the muscle route, a cell must produce muscle factors that bind to DNA to turn on muscle gene expression. However, when cells go awry, they actually travel down a forbidden path where they divide uncontrollably to give rise to a cellular mass. And this is what we see with this child here on the right. Interestingly, in RMS, cells become cancerous despite the presence of muscle factors that normally signal for muscle development. So, I reasoned that in RMS, there must be certain rogue factors that interfere with the normal function of the muscle factors. I was able to identify one such factor called twist, which is disproportionately higher in RMS tumors. When we remove twist from RMS tumors in mice, these cancer cells actually stop dividing and instead they revert to become muscle cells. And this really brings us back to our analogy where in cancer, twist represents this roadblock and when we eliminate it, the cells can now go down the path of muscle development as it is unobstructed. So how does twist change cell identity? Well, from my research, we know that twist interacts with a slew of DNA binding partners, which actually prevent the muscle factors from binding their DNA targets. Many of these twist partners have known inhibitors uh, that can be used in combination with current regimens of chemotherapy in order to maximize therapeutic efficacy. So my research creates possibilities that the child, once diagnosed with RMS, now has a better chance at leaving, leading a tumor-free life. Thank you. Now we have Amy zwarczowski zarate from Dr. Mark Diamond's lab for this, in the Center of Alzheimer's and Neurodegenerative Diseases. Amy is in the neuroscience program. She leapt from the corporate ladder to a calling in science because she wanted to solve problems that deeply impact humankind. Her talk is entitled, When Good Tau Turns Bad, Uncovering the Origin Story of Alzheimer's Disease. Do you ever wonder what turns a good thing bad? Like, how does Darth Vader happen? Supervillains have the best origin stories. We have this need to understand and rationalize what drives a young Anakin Skywalker to transition to the dark side. But it's also useful for understanding neurodegenerative disease. The squiggly line under Anakin is a tau protein. And the tau protein can exist in two states, good and bad. In its good state, it's wonderfully existing inside of our brains. However, it can encounter something that causes it to shape shift, turn bad, and wreak widespread havoc and atrophy on the brain, like that seen under Darth, and also seen in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease. If we could pinpoint the origin story of tau's transition to Alzheimer's disease, maybe we could find ways to revert it back to good. And that's what my project aims to do. Alzheimer's disease is largely sporadic in origin, meaning we don't know what causes it. But we do know that tau is involved, and we know that when tau shape shifts is when people start to show symptoms. Tau is positively charged, and when it encounters negatively charged molecules, it shape shifts as well. A lot of the things we use to do this in the lab, however, are unlikely to be doing this in the brain, except for one, RNA. Using biochemistry, as well as a cellular technique that we've developed in our lab, I can ask questions about what changes tau from good to bad. Our cellular technique takes fluorescent proteins, tags them to tau, and when tau is good, the cells light up and it's diffuse everywhere. 
When tau turns bad, you start to see clumping and aggregates form throughout the cells. To systematically understand how RNA could be converting tau, I took different sequences of RNA, mixed them with tau, and asked whether they turned to tau bad. While all of the sequences bound tau with similar affinity, only some of the sequences turned tau to bad. I wondered if removing the RNA could turn tau back to good. By digesting the RNA away with nucleases, I saw tau revert from bad back to good. I wondered if this could be happening in brains. When I take tau from an Alzheimer's brain and add it to my cells, I see widespread clumping and aggregation throughout all of the cells. But if I treat that tau with nucleases, I see 90% of those cells revert back to their happy, diffuse, good state, suggesting that RNA is involved in the origin story of tau's transition to Alzheimer's disease. And this is what I'm investigating. But I'm not stopping with Alzheimer's disease. I forgot to mention, but tau is involved in 20 other diseases called tauopathies, and if I can find the origin story of tau's transition to cortical basal degeneration or frontal temporal dementia, maybe I can find ways to change it back to good or prevent it from ever transitioning to the dark side in the first place. Next, we have Anu Thomas. She is a student in the Mendel Lab in the Genetics Development and Disease Program. She says she cannot handle horror movies. She watched The Conjuring with a bunch of friends in May and is still not over it. Her talk is entitled RBM33, a cellular postal service for RNAs with GC-rich regions. FedEx, UPS, USPS, Amazon. These are all package delivery services we're very familiar with. But have you ever wondered how molecules in your own body cells get precisely delivered, keeping you healthy and alive. Well, in my thesis project, I wanted to understand how this specific RNA molecule called NORAD gets precisely delivered from where it's made in the cells to where it performs its function. And this is an important question, because if NORAD is not delivered correctly, then the DNA in the cells don't behave properly. There's DNA damage, there's a change in chromosome number, and this is associated with several diseases, such as cancer. So essentially, I wanted to understand what the package delivery service for NORAD is. But we had no clue where to begin looking. So we decided to knock out every single gene in the human cell and ask in which case is the NORAD package delivery being affected. And in order to do this, we modified our cells so that they would glow green if the NORAD package was delivered correctly. And if the package was delivered incorrectly, this glow would be severely reduced. So basically, we ended up knocking out about 19,000 genes in the human cell, one after the other, and asked in which case is the cell's glow reducing. Through these experiments, we identified this gene called RBM33 that nobody had ever studied before as the gene responsible for delivering the NORAD package. And it turns out that RBM33 is more like the cell's own version of a FedEx or a UPS, because in addition to the NORAD package, it delivers hundreds of other RNA packages within the cell. But how does RBM33 know which of the packages it needs to pick up for delivery? Turns out that these RNA packages come with their very own shipping labels, which are uniquely recognized by RBM33. And in this case, the shipping labels are rich in Gs and Cs, which are two of the four building blocks that make up an RNA package. And through the identification of this RBM33 delivery service, we now have an explanation for why over many, many years, scientists have observed that RNA packages with GC-rich regions are transported so efficiently in cells. But why should you care though, right? Well. Guess what other RNA packages have shipping labels rich in Gs and Cs? Viruses, such as those that cause diseases like herpes, mono, Kaposi sarcoma, which is a type of cancer, are all known to be rich in Gs and Cs. So it's possible that when these viruses infect human cells, they may be able to hijack this RBM33 delivery service to now start delivering viral packages instead. And if that's true, we may be able to modulate RBM33 levels in cells to improve our immunity against these viruses. Thank you. Next up, we have Brittany Stewart. Brittany is a graduate student in Dr. Rob Orchard's lab in the Molecular Microbiology Department. Her hobbies include petting dogs, riding horses, and participating in public speaking events where she can be an anxious mess in front of large crowds of people. Her talk is entitled Flipping the Script, Phospholipid Distribution as a Mechanism of Host Defense. 
2020 was an unprecedented year in more ways than one. For all of us, it meant tackling loneliness and isolation. For many of us, it meant becoming stay-at-home elementary school teachers. And for some of us, 2020 was the first time that the impact that viruses have on both public health and the global economy became apparent. Viruses are a natural and essential part of life, and for the most part, humans do a pretty good job of coexisting with these microbes. However, as 2020 reminded us, humans and viruses are in a constant arms race. Understanding how viruses replicate and how our own cells combat viral infection is important for developing antiviral therapeutics and vaccines. Understanding how viruses enter cells is especially important for this. In my work, I aim to understand how lipid asymmetry in the phospholipid membrane uh, uh, affects viral entry. The plasma membrane is composed of phospholipids arranged in a bilayer. And within this bilayer, the lipids are arranged asymmetrically, making the two sides of the membrane similar but slightly different, just like the two sides of a hamburger bun. Proteins known as flipases maintain phospholipid asymmetry. In some cellular events, such as apoptosis, proteins known as scramblases can permanently disrupt lipid asymmetry, resulting in exposure of phosphatidylserine, or PS, on the outer leaflet of the cell. This marks the cell as a dead cell. I've shown that lipid asymmetry is important for viral entry. I've shown that flipases can be proviral, whereas scramblases can be antiviral. And we think that this is linked to the externalization of PS, which is interesting because it suggests that maybe viruses can detect and thereby avoid infecting dead cells that are unable to support viral replication. There are cases, however, in which cells can transiently express PS on the outer leaflet of the membrane, and we think that evasion of viral infection may be one of these cases. And so in this uh, scenario, we would have healthy cells that have normal lipid asymmetry and dying cells that have permanently disrupted lipid asymmetry. And then we have an intermediate, which are these living, clever cells that are able to temporarily put PS on the outer leaflet of the cell and play dead. Just like you might avoid this ugly little hamburger at a buffet, the virus would then avoid these cells during infection. If this is the case, we will have uncovered a new branch of immunology and a new mechanism of host defense. 2020 reminded us that we always have to stay one step ahead of viruses. This work has the potential to allow us to do just that. Thank you. Our seventh speaker is Shoshobana Batra from Dr. Mark Diamond's lab, and she is in the immunology program. If this three-minute thesis gig doesn't work for her, Shoshobana will give a give stand-up comedy a shot, <laughs> and this is not a joke. Her talk is entitled, Alzheimer's Disease, A Tale of a Tau Tangle. So think back again uh, <laughs> when you last forget where you left your car keys or couldn't remember your own cell phone number. Now, imagine the same scenario, but it gradually becoming a permanent part of your life, constantly forgetting the little things that are important details of your life. This forgetfulness is the primary symptom that patients with Alzheimer's disease live with every single day. But what is really going on within the neurons of these patients' brains that results in this loss of memory function? The answer lies in the aggregation of a protein called tau. In healthy brains, tau is just existing in a soluble form, hanging around with the cytoskeletal structures of components of the cell. In disease, however, tau forms these spaghetti-like clumps within the neurons, which leads to their death, and that manifests as cognitive decline over time. These tau aggregates can in turn serve as seeds of propagation, templating onto the monomeric physiological tau in a prion-like manner and cause more tau to continue to aggregate. Remember the saying, one rotten apple can spoil the bunch? So does an aggregated tau. By recruiting healthy fragments of soluble tau into growing clumps of tau tangles over time. It seems natural that the cell would have some mechanism of detecting these tau aggregates as cellular garbage and getting rid of them as soon as possible. Understanding the cell's role in this initial stage and processing of tau aggregation is the very quest of my project. To do this, I basically labeled and detected cellular factors in the vicinity of tau right as it started to aggregate, and this led me to identify a single highly enriched protein called the velocin-containing protein VCP. So what's VCP doing in this whole story? 
Let's go back to the garbage, uh, the, the rotten apple analogy once again. A simple way to get rid of this rotten apple waste is we pass it through the kitchen sink's garbage disposal system, which will break it down into tiny bits and pieces. VCP is your cell's garbage disposal equivalent. My work using cellular models of tau aggregation have shown that VCP can chop down the bulky aggregates of the tau protein into tiny fragments. It does so by almost acting like a machine that will thread through or unfold these little pieces of tau fibrils from a giant clump and then sense these fragments for removal through the cell's degradation machinery. I'm now looking into investigating the precise mechanistic details of how VCP and its related pathways can modulate tau aggregation and thereby identify new therapeutic targets to intervene this aggregation cascade. This is essential to study because by curbing the tau aggregation process, we can help eliminate the uh, underlying root cause of Alzheimer's and thereby contribute to a permanent cure of the disease, a treatment that currently does not exist. Thank you. Thank you to all of our presenters, and we're going to go to a short break for judging, so we're going to tally up all of our, um, our notes and so that we can get you guys our finalists in the next few minutes. Please make sure to look and use this QR code for our People's Choice Award. Thank you. We are now going to invite down the presidents of Speak and GSO while our judges are um, finishing up their forms and while we're counting to kind of just give us a little introduction to these two organizations and to um, kind of fill the time a little bit. But for those of you on Zoom, please remember to use this time as well to vote for your audience favorite. That person is also going to win a prize. Um, so I'll invite down the president of GSO right now. Hello everyone, I'm Lance. I'm the current GSO president. Hopefully GSO needs no introduction as the grad student organization on campus. Um, this year we are really happy to help sponsor the three minute thesis because one thing that we really want to do this year is uh, to continue supporting grad students much more. And one of those things we want to do is through recognition of all the work that grad students do here. And one of the great things like three minute thesis is um, recognizing great communication skills that happen on campus. Um, so look forward or look to more um, awards and opportunities for that in the future. Well, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sophia Bali. I'm the current uh, SPEAK president. Um, so our awesome communications team helped put together this three-minute thesis. Um, so SPEAK is really focused, the name is Science Policy, Education, and Communication. So our club is really focused on sharing your communication um, in sharing your communication to different audiences. Um, so our science policy branch really focuses on sharing your science to local government and um, like the poli implementing that into the policy around like our science and maybe around the nation. Um, education really focuses on sharing your science to the general public, let it be students or uh, adults around our community. And as you see, communication is sharing it to a more technical audience um, where you can really get into the deepness of your, your science, but communicate it clearly across uh, different audiences. Um, so yeah, we hope you guys would want to join Speak. If you want to do that, we have a website and on there you can look up and join us or just email me. Sophia Bali, and then I'll let Valerie introduce our awesome volunteering efforts. Hey, so I'm Valerie. I'm the chair of the education slash outreach committee here at Speak. Um, we're currently trying to expand the activities that we can do with people, especially in light of the ongoing pandemic. So currently, we're focused on virtual outreach events, um, but we're hoping that in the fall we'll be able to do our more traditional in-person outreach events with the Perot Museum and the Dallas Zoo, um, as well as our local community partners um, with different schools um, in the area. So yeah, just stay tuned for um, announcements about any of those events. If you would like to participate, um, you don't have to be a part of Speak, you can just come help out. Um, and then if you would like to join the club, you know, of course, we'd be happy to have you. So um, yeah, with that, I'll turn it back to Sophia or I guess to Priyanka. Thank you. Um, we're going to just take a couple more minutes to finish up the judging. So if our Zoom audience can just hang out for a second, um, go get a drink of water or something, we will be back momentarily and we'll announce the um, winners uh, as soon as we finish tallying up the votes. So thank you guys.
while we're waiting, on behalf of all of the judges, we just wanted you to know how excellent every one of the presentations was. It was very hard to come to any of these numbers and, and judging. So I just wanted you all to know that before this is announced. Okay, so we'll start with our third place winner, which, yeah, you can say, which was a tie, uh, it was a tiebreaker, so go ahead. Yes, we had a very, very, very close third place tie, which was separated by one vote. And so in third place, with Lance giving out the award to, it's Amy zwierczowski Zarati. <laughs> On to our runner-up, we have Martina Casanova. And for our 2021 winner of the Three Minute Thesis and our first annual Three Minute Thesis winner is Anu Thomas. Thank you so much to all the judges, and we are still finalizing our People's Choice Award. Yes, and we will, we will announce our People's Choice Award after the fact so that we don't have to have our Zoom link on for everything. All right, thank you to everybody who's watched, and I'm really excited to have this go on again next year.